Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this panel. We're here to discuss the Labour Party and the UK's post-Brexit uh, foreign and defence policy. I am Shashank Joshi. I'm defence editor at The Economist, where I cover military and security issues. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased to have an excellent panel to discuss these issues. I'll, I'll introduce them in a minute, um, but I'll just set the panel up for, for a moment first. Um, and if I can just request all the panelists to mute themselves for a second, that would uh, that will that will aid this process. If everyone can mute themselves, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so this is obviously a, a perfect time to discuss this. We're looking at significant changes um, uh, uh, in the diplomatic landscape. Uh, America poised on the cusp of an election that could change its direction very substantially. China asserting itself uh, in Asia uh, against India, Taiwan, other parts of Asia, but also in Europe itself. And uh, the post-Brexit landscape in terms of the UK's relationship with Europe also looking uh, uh, very open at this stage. Um, and, and amid all of that, this government is obviously undertaking what it calls the most sweeping review of defence, foreign policy and security, as well as aid since the Cold War, since the end of the Cold War itself, uh, a review that already seems to be resulting in some uh, substantial direction of change, at least when it comes to defence, as we've seen in the past couple of weeks with the Defence Minister highlighting a move away from mass uh, towards uh, uh, an armed force built more around uh, speed and agility and, and, and so on. Um, so I think it's a perfect time to discuss this uh, and how the Labour Party sees many of these questions uh, in, in, in terms of the UK's future foreign policy, uh, the question of relations with America, China and Europe, uh, the role of the new Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and how the UK might strengthen all of the various multilateral uh, groupings, blocks and alliances of which we are a part. Um, I think we're all interested in, um, in, in how uh, uh, the party sees itself in that context. So uh, to discuss that, please let me introduce uh, an excellent panel. We have Khalid Mahmood, who is the Shadow Minister for Defence uh, uh, with responsibility for defence procurement. We have Catherine West, the Shadow Foreign Minister with responsibility for Europe and the Americas. And joining us uh, in about 20 minutes or so, we'll have Admiral Lord West, uh, a, a former First Sea Lord, and obviously as well a former security minister under a Labour government. Um, we'll, we'll start with opening remarks from all the panellists and then um, come back for an open discussion. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand in Zoom, put questions. Policy exchange team will get those questions to me uh, and I will put those to the panel. Uh, so, um, Khaled, if you'd like to kick us off, please, um, maybe you could give us your, your sense of impressions as to how you uh, uh, see <coughs> Labour policy on the areas that I mentioned, and then perhaps we can probe a little bit more into some of the specifics on the areas of your responsibility. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, and uh, nice to see Catherine back in the shadow front bench. Uh, she was a great minister when we were shadow minister when we were together, and is somebody you have very high, huge amount of regard for, and I thank her. Uh, for coming on here for short notice as well. Uh, Catherine, thank you very much. Uh, look, I mean, to start off with, first of all, what we have to look at is as the opposition to a current Her Majesty's government, uh, uh, what we have to look at is this government currently uh, and, and the role it's taking. And I think our policy to an extent has to be look at, first of all, uh, checks and balances against that and then our own policy in relation to that. First of all, I think the issues that the government is coming into, and you mentioned this review, uh, that they're doing, and also the combination of DFID into the Foreign Office. I think there are two huge issues, uh, and, and I don't know quite where government wants to go with this, other than to cut money, other than to save money. That is essentially what this is. And no amount of uh, speak and everything else that they're trying to do is going to fool anybody around this, because this is purely about cutting money and cutting resources. Where you've got DFID operations and where you've got the uh, Foreign Office, the Embassy, uh, operations in most of the countries, they will try and rationalize that. Uh, and that's where this issue is about. I think we've had for a long time a very distinct policy uh, on DFID uh, and all, uh, and predominantly all of the people in, in the, who understand the role of the DFID and the Foreign Office uh, are not in favor of this move, whether they're Labour or Conservatives or all other parties that are there. Because you have to understand distinctly the role 
uh, that Diffid is playing this. Diffid has a very unique soft power role uh, in all of this. Uh, and I think what is happening in this government is, is that they're trying to manipulate the two and use some of the funding that they tried, as the Conservative tried to do before, uh, in terms of some of the arms trading and other issues that they want to do, and mix up the funding that's there. Uh, I think we had a unique position, uh, position in relation to that. We had a Labour government which set the budget, uh, which was stuck to by, by all governments until now. And I think part of that review is to take some of that money away. Uh, from, from there. So I think we have a policy uh, which we need to look at in terms of how do we combat some of those issues. I think internationally, very quickly, I know that we've got a specific amount of time to start off with. Uh, US is at cusp at the moment, depending on uh, whether the presidential uh, elections bring, it, bring about a change or not. Uh, and if they don't, it'll be more, more of the same, uh, more of the bombastic approach that's been going on. Uh, and I think the real issue in relation to that is, is the role that the uh, Americans have in relation to particularly China uh, and then in relation to Russia. Uh, I think those are the two key big uh, issues that, that need to be resolved. Uh, and I don't see really any, any uh, cohesive policy uh, from uh, uh, America in, in, in relation to that. I think China is, has, has stolen the march on all of us essentially, uh, particularly in, in development of its Belt and Road project uh, which has gone right across the world. It is, by in a sense, I think the word I use is colonization by economic development. Uh, and particularly in Africa, if you look at the way that they've got that through Asia, South, South Asia, particularly the way they're doing that, and all the way through Russia uh, into Europe uh, and the way they're coming in on the back of that. Uh, and I think they've built a huge, huge amount of resource to back that up. Uh, and I think now trying to tear us away from that, uh, I think it will need a huge job but I think there has to be an issue in terms of security with China. Uh, and I think that is, is the key issue. And then therefore the issue around the uh, 5G uh, issues that we've had in terms of security uh, and in, in terms of other cyber security issues uh, that come along. So I think there are a lot of big issues uh, for us to try and deal with. Uh, and I think we've got to see post Brexit where we stand in that. Brexit is over, as Keir Starmer said today. We're not discussing that anymore. The decisions have been made. Now what we need to do is go forward and see how we interact with the world and how we deal with that and how we move forward with that. So I think we've got to look at seriously in relation to what we do, how we interact with those countries and how we get bullied perhaps by the US into different positions where we shouldn't be at. So the, the, the issue of the Labour Party in relation to all this, I think, uh, is, is essentially being, of course, uh, in, in a good relationship with the US, but also not being told by the US to do whatever they want us to do. We have to have our own. We have to particularly look at the Brexit agreement with the US, whether that's beneficial to us, uh, and particularly in terms of the National Health Service, uh, and also local, a lot of local government and national government uh, departments that we're looking at. We've had a huge failure in terms of the some of the contracted out services as we stand currently. And if that goes to American organizations, I think there'd be a real issue in relation to those sort of agreements. So we need to be really serious on that and to be able to look at that. So is that enough time for me? So just going to go on for a bit longer. If you want to finish up your thoughts, please do, and then I'll-, I'll Yeah, I'll, uh, just, just basically do that. And I think th there's a lot more to come, particularly in terms of defense. Uh, and I think one of the issues that you raised about defense, again, trying to cut the, uh, the, the manpower or, or the workforce in relation to that. Perhaps manpower is not the right word to use these days. Uh, the, 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 the personnel issues in that. You've got to have the people with boots on, properly trained to do that. There are issues that you can work with artificial intelligence that we're trying to do, and there's a huge possibility for that. But if you haven't got the resources, if you haven't got the actual personnel on board to carry out some of those activities, you will not be able to succeed. So I think there has to be a balance. And, and, and I think what the government's trying to do now at the moment is trying to get out of the commitments they have currently, which we want currently to be used there's a huge amount of projects that are waiting that need to be delivered. I spoke yesterday in the comments about 1.5 billion uh, uh, fleet solid support ships uh, that are there. The, the minister choose to refer to them as warships, battleships, which they're clearly not. But anyway, uh, I think that, that would save about 2,500 jobs in the UK. There's a number of the shovel ready projects that they are there. For, for, for the government to do. And I see again, I think what they're trying to do in relation to that is by saying we need to go in, in, into new technologies uh, and look at artificial intelligence to deal with this, again, is a way to try and cut down some of that resource. 
and I think also particularly people should also be uh, cautious of the bill coming through uh, tomorrow uh, in the Commons, in, in, particularly in relation to the veterans. Uh, and of course, we're not opposing it, but at, as the official opposition, I think we've got to look at some of the issues in there which are not in the best interests uh, of past soldiers and veterans. I mean, to be very, very firm on that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Khalid. Before I move on to Catherine, maybe I can just continue that strand we're on, um, on the subject of defence, on the subject of, of resources. Um, and you framed the, the, the review and, and the measures being taken as, as effectively cost-cutting measures rather than and, and strategic measures. And I, I guess that sort of, we should put the question to you then. And, and I, had a, I had a question from uh, on Twitter from, from uh, Paul Lever, who's a, who's a former British ambassador to Germany and a, a chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, who said, um, you know, is is are you committed to the current Royal Navy and Royal Air Force procurement programs? And if so, do you accept uh, that the army has to give up its armored warfare capability, uh, which is a subject that's been in, under discussion? And I think the spirit of that question is it's all well and good to criticize uh, uh, cuts. But of course, there are, there are trade offs to be made. And unless, unless the defense budget grows, you are effectively looking at <coughs> trading off funds from some areas of defense to others. Uh, and so the question is, um, where, where do you make those trade offs? You can't have it all. And if you are committed to the Navy and, and Air Force procurement programs, in which there's, of course, big, you know, big, big commitments looming, uh, and it's perfectly fair to say you're not. But if you are, um, do you accept that actually you would, you know, you, you would also, in, uh, under your proposals or your plans or visions, also have to make these uh, certain commitments and cuts in, in this area? How do you, how do you deal I, I with those what, trade offs? I think, in terms of procurement, what you've got to look at very seriously is how we use the platforms that we have currently. Uh, and what we've done is we have projects running for almost 15 years, which have continuously gone on. Uh, in, in terms of their funding and extended funding on top of that and huge budget overruns. What we needed to do is to look in relation to the National Audit Office and the projects that are coming through there. What we've done essentially is started off with something which was never fit for purpose in the first place. And then we tried to adapt it and adapt it and adapt it. What we've got to be able to do in modern warfare, in modern planning, and particularly in terms of uh, procurement, is we've got to look at platforms that have a basic uh, uh, outlay uh, uh, design on which you bolt on a number of the new uh, uh, interchangeability in that. And what we're not doing at the moment is looking at that interchangeability of new technologies coming onto older vessels and older type uh, of equipment that we have. So what we need to do is to look at how we can maintain what we have, but rather than spend a huge amount of time, as we've done on 15-year projects uh, and 12-year projects, which have actually not gone as further. I'm trying to look at a detail in relation to try and, try and resolve that. We're gonna look at better way of procuring uh, some of these issues. And I think that is where we need to look at the funding and how we procure. I think the, the cutting back on just the army is not an answer. The army is needed. I think better personnel issues and better personnel uh, in terms of people uh, on the ground, people with boots, are needed in the army because if we are to go forward in the way the current climate that we have, whether we, we, need, we need to protect some of our uh, territories or whether they need to be engaged in a particular situation, particularly in relation to Europe. Uh, if you look at Russia's position at the moment uh, and its aggression towards Eastern Europe, what we have to look at is how we, we try and deal with that and how we play our role in terms of NATO as well. So we do need uh, those soldiers. Uh, we do need those people with boots on the ground to be able to do that. So it can't be a trade-off with the RAF uh, as long with that. I think what we've got to do, and I think this is what should have been done, I think it's been tried, uh, but not really successful. But looking at taking apart the whole procurement program uh, and looking at what we have currently, in what time scale that can be delivered, and how we do it, and perhaps start to look at financing these projects on an individual basis and doing their calculations through the, NA, uh, the, the National Audit Office to be able to do that and work that properly. But it can't be a trade-off. I think what we'd have to do is look at the uh, efficiency of that, but not necessarily just say, we're gonna cut this and cut that. I think that's happened too much. And I think since 2010, too much of those just blatant cuts are coming without looking at what's needed in terms of for the forces and what the requirements the Army, the Navy and the Air Force have to deal with that. It's gotta be a strategic plan. It can't be a trade-off between the Army between the uh, Air Force or the Navy. And I think that's important for us to realise that. OK, well, I'm sure we'll come back to defence a bit later on, but um, perhaps we can move on to you, Catherine. Um, you're, as, as, I, as I said, minister with shadow minister with responsibility for Europe and the Americas, which in some ways frames 
uh, two of the UK's most um, uh, uh, significant relationships. Tell us how you see that balance playing out in the years ahead and, and tell us what you see as uh, 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 your, your sort of um, your distinctive and, and most important points of departure from the government and how you see Labour policy uh, evolving on that. Well, I mean, I think we all know in this meeting that the three pillars of good foreign policy are you know, national security, human rights, and uh, trade. And I think we need to see those three things in a balance. So I really welcome this discussion. Um, and I think in the light of Keir's speech this morning, uh, what I'll do in my five minutes is just to outline sort of the, the change between sort of six months ago and now, or what is it, 10 months ago now and now um, on the foreign policy piece. Um, so first of all, strengthening our position on Russia. Um, we, we all remember the Skripal poisonings and a, certain, a sense of uncertainty in Labour's position. Um, and Lisa Nandy has moved swiftly to um, strengthen um, our position on Russia. And of course, the Russia report, which was released in the last week of term before we all went off for the summer, really demonstrated the government's gaping hole in the center of our defenses. And it's a very modern concept of foreign policy because of the element of interference in the cyber world and social media. And that's um, an issue that we will come back and back to again, because it's all very well to say that you know, you are stronger than Labour on defence, but if you're just allowing Russian oligarchs to infiltrate your political party and give you millions of pounds, or if you're allowing the um, Russian bots to interfere in our democracy, then to me, that is a large hole in our defence, which needs to be fixed immediately. Um, we also know that... Um, there's certain legislation that's needed. For example, um, I would like to see a debate on the Foreign Agents Registration Act so that we can review what further um, legislation is needed to protect ourselves from um, a Russia which potentially will become even more aggressive because it is in economic decline. Um, and that's something which we need to have an urgent debate on. Um, we also, of course, feel that Brexit is fracturing that very strong defence that we had with the E3 and with um, our Eastern European neighbours neighbor, as well. And that just adds an extra layer of complication to the Russia question, because if we didn't have to be um, having an identity crisis over Brexit all the time and looking to the right wing of the Tory party for guidance, we would actually be able to focus on Russia as a threat. Instead, we have to put up with UKIP Brexit falling into the Tory party and creating these false debates where we really should be focusing on how do we pre prevent Russia infiltrating us as a country culturally in cyber terms. And I don't think militarily necessarily right now, but you know, you have to understand defence in the wider definition. The other um, challenge, of course, is China, the growth of China. Um, and, you know, personally for me, having lived in China in the 1990s, you know, China has changed a lot. And as Khalid said, you know, this Belt and Road Initiative, it's been like a chess game. We've all been watching it. We know what, what's happening, but we haven't really sat down together with allies and talked about how we counter it. And at the same time, we're sort of metaphorically departing the stage because the US has not been showing the international leadership, which it could have done, which means that if you're going to depart the international stage, and if you're going to just dump the DFID department and put it in the bin and stop giving economic help to nations, then I think it's very hard to blame them if they do accept economic help from China. So, you know, I think that we have um, real challenges there in terms of winning over the five eyes, winning over a vision that we can be just as loyal to developing nations as China has been for the last 20 years. You know, we won't be stop start, we won't be giving them lots of money one year and none the next. You know, we need to have a strategic vision which builds ourselves up 
in the eye of those developing countries, which of course China has slowly in a sort of chessboard move overtaken us. Um, the other thing to say, of course, is um, you would imagine that um, my job had a lot to do with Brexit, being the Shadow Europe Minister, but in fact, much of my time has been taken up in Belarus, um, with Belarus, not physically there, but really with the women's struggle there. Um, you know, the image of that Lukashenko dressed in black leather with a gun across his shoulder is just deeply frightening. Um, and we've been trying to reach out to trade union colleagues in a discreet way um, to try and build up um, relationships there and to try and work with the trade unions as a people movement so that they have a chance to actually have some independence, have proper elections um, and decide themselves which direction they want their own country to go in. Um, so it's been a really fascinating role so far. Um, and also the Navalny poisoning, of course, in the last few months has provided us with another opportunity to um, put down a marker about our values and democracy and the importance of safety for opposition members. And it's just very disappointing that in the last 24 hours, Mr. Trump has once again failed to stand up for the opposition in Russia. Instead, he sort of has failed to condemn Mr. Putin for what is clearly um, a state-sponsored poisoning, similar to the Skripal and the Litvinenko poisonings. So we're trying to do a lot across um, that part of the world. Also a challenge to our own strength because at the moment Brexit is weakening us significantly, but one of our strengths which does still remain is our financial center. And how can we use that as a tool to develop um, a proper world order using that to crack down on um, shell companies in the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, um, and the use of our City of London with certain accountants, bankers, and others basically laundering the funds which come through. So you know, it's quite a wide definition of defence, but I think each um, country needs to play its part in terms of keeping certain rogue, rogue states and holding them to account. And our strongest weapon at the moment is still the financial sector in the City of London, and we should be expecting them to do more. So with the Shadow tre Treasury colleagues, Pat McFadden and others, we're developing an approach which holds our own government to account on that, because um, Sheshank, I'm sure you noticed that um, in the recent Magnitsky sanctions, which we really welcome um, on the Labour side, um, corruption wasn't a heading. And in the statutory instrument, which followed the um, announcement, I challenged um, the minister on that. And he said, well, we're still looking at it. And, you know, he's very weak on it, basically. And I think unless we are actually going to say corruption is wrong and we are going to do something about that, then we may as well just take our ball and go home. Um, this is somewhere where we can really make a difference internationally. And the power is in our hands to do something about the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands. Only we can do something about that. Um, so we'll be continuing also with that theme, as well as perhaps some of the more traditional um, hardware, which Khaled has mentioned earlier on. Catherine, thanks very much. Can I just um, uh, get you to say a little bit more about the United States and um, how you see uh, the the how you see the stakes in terms of a, a Biden administration or a second Trump administration? How do you think each of those uh, affects UK policy, and how do you think how do you think your policy changes in response to each of those scenarios? I mean, the idea that everything would suddenly be a rainbow colour if Mr. Biden was election, elected is not true, of course. Um, and having sat on the International Trade Select Committee and travelled to the US and Canada, um, I think there are some very serious questions that we have to ask ourselves. And we know that the, the farm lobby is not just going to go away if Mr. Trump, if Mr. Biden gets elected. I suspect it's going to be the same sorts of issues. And that's why trade is that third pillar of good foreign policy, because we have to be realistic that we want to have a trade deal with other partners. Uh, and obviously the two key issues are food standards, animal husbandry, um, sanitary and phytosanitary issues um, for the UK and the US. Um, and the second one is around um, health services, the NHS, not just a traditional sort of concept of health services, but 
the pharmacology, life sciences, um, the database, which is our N NHS. That's what's valuable. It's the longevity of the data which we hold within the, the NHS. And that will be subject to this trade deal because pharma companies want to use that to, you know, um, you know, further their interests as pharma companies, and they want to have collaborations along those lines. So that's the sort of thing that we have to make a decision on. And yet in the House of Commons, if you could have a serious debate about that, I'd be very happy. Instead, we have this ridiculous internal markets bill debate, which is just playing to the right wing of the Tory party. We're in the grip of the Brexit stroke Tory party in the House of Commons. They're not even entering into serious debates about what this trade deal is going to look like. Instead, we're, we're having to listen to, you know, my constituents told me I wanted Brexit. You know, that debate is closed, it's finished. And now we have to be nimble and look forward to the future on what these trade deals are actually going to mean. And in any deal, we have to give something up. Are we having the honest conversations with the sectors that are going to be affected in the UK? Regardless of Biden or Trump, we are going to have to give something up. Brexit's going to continue to cost us. And I just wish we could have some of those conversations instead of this sort of faux debate that we keep having in the Commons. Thank you. Can I just remind anyone listening, they can ask questions by raising their hand on Zoom or by typing your question into the chat box on Zoom or YouTube, and we'll, we'll come back to some of those questions um, a little bit later. I, I wonder if I could um, broaden out the discussion to other types of security. Catherine, you've already raised um, a sort of the idea of, of resilience um, and, and having foreign agents register as, uh, register as, register as such, um, uh, thinking more about the vulnerability of financial systems and, and, use, and using those means. Um, if, if I look at sort of a, a different areas of technology, two of them that are increasingly important for uh, are um, uh, space and cyberspace, outer space and cyberspace. Uh, both of them are increasingly domains of military competition, attacks are taking place in cyberspace daily, um, including major state-backed attacks, uh, both both disruptive and um, uh, what you might call sort of uh, uh, information or disinformation attacks. And in space, we're seeing an increasing variety of anti-space weapons. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had both the UK and the US accuse Russia of testing an anti-satellite weapon. Um, what I'd like to know, and perhaps Khaled, we can, we can begin with you, and then Catherine, we can hear your views as well, on, on how do you see um, uh, uh, um, a policy in these areas? What do you want to see, uh, both in terms of British capabilities in cyberspace and space, in terms of um, um, uh, uh, offensive and defensive capabilities? Um, and what do you see as the appropriate international uh, agreements on this? These are both areas with relatively limited uh, um, uh, norms or laws. And, and, and what do you see as a kind of feasible uh, um, um, a system of, of restraint in these areas. Khaled, perhaps we could begin with you. Well, I think sooner or later there has to be an agreement in relation to development of this stuff, uh, this sort of uh, policy and these sort of equipment. Uh, I know that we have uh, a lot of the companies now, particularly even including Rolls-Royce, uh, looking at uh, moving into the space arena looking at defense in terms of relation to that, looking at how cyber is very important to deal with that. So I think there is a lot of uh, work being done currently at the moment. Uh, I think the current uh, chief of procurement in the army, CGS, is, is, is looking to increase a, a lot of the technological uh, advancements that are being made in terms of our troops, because a lot of this assisted uh, gear or equipment that would support our people on, on, on the ground would be uh, artificial in, intelligence led, would be uh, uh, roving uh, machines that will go in first and, 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 the, and our soldiers okay. behind that. And if somebody can get access to those would be a huge issue. Access to our satellites would be a huge issue. Access to our defense controls uh, and systems would be a huge issue. So I think there's a huge issue around a setting up a national, uh, I, I think we'd have to look at setting up a national uh, facility. We, we have some sort of a, a work at the moment that we're doing, but we're not doing enough to ensure that we can regulate and check on who's doing what and what sort of technologies they have and what's been implemented in the UK by other people. So I think different technologies are coming in which we're not totally 
familiar with their capabilities. So I think first of all, we have to look at what comes into the UK and what people are using in the way that they want to use it and what extent, other extent they have in relation to that capacity. So I think there is a lot of new issues that have come through and we really have to look at, at a new, uh, perhaps a committee uh, that looks at this and advises parliament uh, on what is there and what regulation we should be looking at, what uh, sort of uh, bills we need to put in to try and regulate that. But this is a vast area that we haven't even got to the tip of this. And I think it's going to be a huge issue that we need to look at. Sorry, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. And once again, this is an area where, as Khaled said, we need a national approach. But because a lot of this approach is very expensive, we also need to be working with international partners. Um, hence my concern that we are having some minor debates about Brexit when we could actually be talking about the things which really matter. Um, and I feel particularly on this point that working with the US, working with um, European partners is crucial in terms of developing um, what we actually need to be competitive in that space arena. Um, one thing that's been bothering me is every time there's another government injection of funds for COVID, obviously our debt goes up and up and up um, and our GDP goes down and down and down. Um, and obviously we have a commitment to spend 2% of GDP on defence, but much of the equipment that's used in these space programs is extremely expensive. So we're going to have to, um, you know, take a view, I would imagine in the spring, sorry, that's the division bell going, I don't have to go and vote. Um, I think we will see in the spring that when the Chancellor goes to look at how we manage that 2% of spend, it's going to come down a lot, you know, um, and I'm sure that's part of the reason why defit has been thrown out the window. Um, but you know, this is going to have to be part of the strategic review um, and an element of that will have to be go through the select committee as well to talk about what are the costs, how will the budget stretch to cover our element of a credible space project. I don't know whether any of you followed the debate at the time when we were pulling out of some of the space work in because of Brexit um, and Mr Cummings has found some interesting um, project which is a bit niche to spend on um, sort of cyber defence and so on and I think we've got to be very careful of those sorts of projects. We should be doing things in partnership with our allies um, rather than just wasting money on small projects which might look good and might get a, a newspaper heading um, but we need to have tried and tested scientific approaches which are obviously you know as close as possible to the EU. And if Labour was in government, we would be working much more closely with European neighbours on this particular element of space because it just seems um, illogical to do it all on our own when there's similar research going on in other places and yes. we should be pooling our resources. Obviously, we need a national approach, but pooling our resources with others. Thank you, Catherine. Um, uh, Admiral Lord West is here, so uh, uh, welcome to the panel. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm not sure how much you've heard of that question, but I wonder if we can yeah. pull you back to the beginning. Well, uh, I, and I, we, I, we... I, I, I would actually, uh, before you take back to the beginning, on that particular question, I think in terms of cyber, you know, we are actually, without uh, trying to be complacent, we are well placed as a nation. GCHQ are, is an amazing resource, and the NCSC. Um, the Yukusa agreement signed in 47 means we're joined at the hip with NSA. That was, of course, signed when Clement Attlee was the Prime Minister. Um, and that puts us in, a, in an amazing position, really. Um, and a lot of work is going on in this area. We must clearly keep up the funding in the SIA for these agencies, and Labour will do that. And that's um, a single intelligence account. That's a single intelligence account, and Labour will do that because that is a very key factor in this. Um, so on that cyber thing, I think we'll move forward as we're going. We produced the first ever cyber strategy. I did that in 2009. It's been updated, I think, four times since then for the UK, which shows how quickly things are changing. But yes, we've got to keep a very close eye on it. Will we get international agreements? Very difficult to get international agreements because people like Russia and China break all the rules. 
And it's very difficult, therefore, to get an agreement that everyone will sign up to. It would be wonderful if we could. I'm not convinced we'll be able to. Yes, we should keep some effort into it, but I don't believe we'll get there. But we are, in other respects, I think we're, you know, we're on the front foot, be trying to beat what is growing at an exponential rate, the threat to us. When we talk about space, we have an amazing small satellite capability in this country. And that is something that we would support immensely. You know, we believe very firmly in having sovereign capability. Um, with British workmen at the high end doing and producing these things, that's great. Um, the complexity of now going into the Star Wars thing is something we clearly couldn't do on our own. We've got to work with people. I think we look at the niches we're very good at, like small satellites, and work with the Americans to do that. So that's how I'd see we move that. It is a very important thing. Space is so important in terms particularly of positioning, time signals, um, you know, strike type operations. It is very, very important to that. I'm very happy to go back to the beginning now if you uh, yes, want I, to I mean, that. That, that, that in, that's a useful route to take us back to the, the overarching question of um, we, we have an integrated review that's underway. We've seen in the past uh, week or so um, a, a hint of the direction that it may be taking in defence, which is to say, um, I think as the, as the Ben Wallace put it, uh, a shift away from mass towards perhaps what you might call sort of a, a focus on technology, uh, on speed, on agility, on more niche capabilities, including those in space and cyberspace that you've mentioned. So I guess the question I have is, do you think that that's the right direction for the armed forces to be moving in? Or would you be doing things differently? All of it, of course, with the assumption that resources are constrained and fixed, and therefore that if you, if you emphasize these areas, you will have to uh, de-emphasize um, uh, what some people might call sunset capabilities or, or existing assets. How would you manage those trade-offs? All of these areas that are talked about, uh, and, and AI and quantum, are very, very important. They're very important. Um, but as I've said in an article I wrote the other day, in the final analysis, I'm afraid warfare is visceral and needs kinetic force. And I said, I'm quite willing to face Dominic Cummings in a field, him with a laptop and me with a machine gun. And I, I think I can tell you who would win. Um, so, I mean, that's rather glib, but my point is you still need mass, you still need killing power. Not huge mass, but you've got to have enough. One ship can only be in one place. And if you've got a problem in four places, one ship doesn't cut the mustard. And I'm afraid there have been successive cuts. The 2010 Defence Review cut the UK's military capability by a third. I don't think anyone ever came clean about that. That's what it did. The last decent defence review was the 97-8-98 one. Um, you know, that, that was a, a decent attempt, but I'm afraid it was underfunded after that by about a billion a year. And this is the problem. The Treasury keeps snipping away at things. And I think we've been quite clear that the 2%, yes, we'd stick with the 2%, but the 2% that the government have worked with has not been a real 2%. They put in lots of pensions and other things. Now, there is a real worry, as was said, uh, a minute ago, because the GDP will be less, and 2% of a smaller GDP means less money. And I think this will have to be looked at very carefully. I think in, in Labour's terms, um, we very strongly believe in sovereign capability. Things like shipbuilding, aircraft building, these sort of things are very important, and they always have been. It's interesting, if you look at expenditure since 1945, Labour has spent more on defence than the Tories. Who would ever guess that? So I think that's a very interesting Factor. I've, I've, I've got to press you on this because either we're saying we have to do less of nothing, we can do everything we did uh, plus all the extra stuff on technology in emerging areas, or, or we accept strategy is about saying what you will do less of as well as what you will do more of. And so we have to have an answer to that question, you know, where do we do less? Well, I, I, think, I think the reality is we're probably going to have to spend a bit more money. Um, if you look at Australia, they've just upped their, they're up their defence budget by 90% over the next 10 years. They, that shows but, they're pretty worried about what's going on, doesn't it? But, that, but that um, that, that, that's impossible here, isn't it? And of well, course the well no, nothing, is nothing's one. impossible. It depends what you want to spend it on. What the government mustn't do, or the people doing the review mustn't do, is come up with sort of uh, uh, smoke and mirrors and pretend that they've met the problem. We have got to see what is the real threat to this country. Global stability is crucial to our nation. And there's nothing like, not madly huge forces, but uh, uh, let's say a few ships to, call, to, to create stability. You know, we, we run global shipping from UK. 
95% of all our trade comes in by sea. We're the biggest investor in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Pacific Rim. That's all great for our foreign exchange. If we don't have stability, then the very wealth and security of our nation is hammered. That priority has to be looked at, and it's no good pretending. If the government says, right, we've got no money, well, actually, look, I'm sorry, it will be less stable. We won't be able to look after our shipping. Um, there, there is a possibility of flashpoint wars, but that's what we've got to put up with. We've got no money. Fine, be realistic about it. But they won't. They, I'm afraid they'll use smoke and mirrors, and that is what really worries me. Can I... Um, uh Let's 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 look at the sort of a broader landscape again, and particularly the question of of, uh, of uh, the U.S. and NATO. If if we do find ourselves in a second Trump term, uh, and and the the, uh, the possibility of a U.S. Um, a dilution of its commitment in NATO itself, Khalid, how how worried are you about that scenario? And and in substantive terms, what do you, what do you think can be done about it? How how far do you think the U.K. ought to um, deepen its cooperation with European partners and the various defence structures that they are developing, things like uh, PESCO uh, for defence capability, the European Intervention Initiative led by France, um, uh, uh, and various other, uh, uh, various other European projects. How far do you think the UK will have to be pushed in that direction if we see a weakening of the alliance? And how worried are you about that? The, the answer is that I'm extremely and sorry. Worried. Can I can I go to Khalid first? No, oh, sorry, we'll come back yes, to I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, I'm talking too loud. I'm very happy for Lord West uh, to say something, but yeah, since you pose a question, uh, I think look quite simply. First of all, I don't think uh, America will uh, weaken its resolve towards NATO. Uh, it sees the threat from Russia. It sees what's going on, and I think if you speak to a lot of the senior military uh, people. They are quite aware of what's going on, and NATO will remain, and I think it will remain. I think what we've got to do is look at how we properly contribute to that. Uh, and I think not by, uh, as Lord West has quite rightly said, by smokes and mirrors, including our pensions into that, and say we're doing this to 2% mark. I think we have to look at uh, what capability we have and what really uh, we can do with, in terms of our friend, uh, in, in terms of our defense capability. Uh, and since been decimated by the Tories in 2010. Uh, I think what we also have to look at, and, and this French proposal uh, that we keep talking about, uh, I, I don't think that's ever going to see the light of day. Uh, I think uh, the French uh, wanted to have a bit of a soundbite before Brexit, uh, and, and that's what it was, was all about. Uh, and I think ultimately, if you look at a lot of the uh, countries across Eastern Europe, right across there, you have NATO you are already contributing towards NATO. So contributing towards something else, uh, I don't think is going to work. I think what will happen, uh, has perhaps it's happened over uh, different actions that have been taken, is we can work in coordination with France and any other nation uh, we have outside of Europe, uh, looking at some of the interests that we share uh, in relation to that. Uh, but I think a single force uh, or, or a European force, uh, as the French have been continuously saying uh, in relation to that, I think it's very difficult. We have NATO, we have the structures that are there already, uh, and replicating any of that is not going to help. Uh, and so therefore, I think we'll stick to that and we'll deal with that, and that's, that's where it stands. Catherine, this is an area where your two portfolios are in, are in tension, particularly in terms of defense industry, um, uh, and, and you know, sh how far should the UK hedge its bets uh, on this, and, and how make sure that it has, a, it has one foot in these emerging European initiatives across the defence space? Um, I feel that COVID will put all, everything into flux again, um, even though Lord West has said that Australia, and I noticed, noticed this because I, I follow the Australian press, um, 80 to 90 percent increase in uh, defence spending. A lot of it's hardware, of course, down in South Australia, but um, I think what's interesting is for the first time in 20 years, they've had two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Um, and, you know, if we go into another lockdown this autumn, our budget in spring of next year is going to look dreadful. Um, so we're going to have 2% of very little. Um, so I think right now, in a sense, anyone can say anything until we actually know what we're dealing with financially, um, it's going to be very difficult to know. I mean, it may even be that certain commitments that have been made 
on you know long-term projects may have to be reviewed um so you know because the us and the uk have been hit so badly by covid um i think that does call into question budgets and i think we will have to lengthen the time because often with a strategic budget you know it's over a five-year period i really think we could be looking at a particular expenditure over an eight or nine year period um and so you know i feel it, it really does change the calculation it doesn't change the priorities because you know your priorities about where your heart is as a country and all the rest of it but i think we've got to be very realistic that um the us and the uk are going to be you know quite sort of hobbled by um the covid disaster that this is um however you know it may be that other countries can come to the fore it may be that there are other strategies that we can use but you know our failure to really get on top of covid will have long term consequences um and admiral uh well clearly nato is hugely hugely important basically nato and uh, in fact let's be realistic the us and uk contribution and part of it ensured the security and safety of europe from 1949 right up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. It also effectively stopped there being a world war. Um, and, and NATO is still crucially important. So I am worried if America should start be lessening their uh, feeling about NATO. I'm not convinced they will even with whatever Trump said, but, but that would really worry me. As regards Europe, I'm afraid Europe have been very bad about putting their money where their mouth is in terms of defense. And their talk on defense very often relates to uh, new headquarters going up, and it's difficult to kill anyone with their headquarters, um, or also to do with procurement, because they want lots of procurement. I'm all for procurement. I think it's great, but it should be done with a purpose um, to have weapons that enable you to ensure peace and security. I'm not sure always in the European thing that is the case. It's just to have you know, jobs allocated here, there, and everywhere. And therefore, I, I'm very nervous about some of the pushes for European defense. Having said that, the security of Europe is crucial for the security of this nation. And let's face it, we are part of Europe. Um, so we might not be part of the EU, but we are part of Europe. Um, and therefore, it is important the way they react. I thought their reaction to Galileo, someone mentioned it earlier, was absolutely outrageous to say that, oh, well, as you're not going to be fully part of this, we're not going to let you have any of the classified intelligence. We, when I was a minister, back when Labour were in power, we agreed to give very highly classified intelligence to Europeans to protect them from terrorism. I mean, you do not do things like that. And that did shock me, I have to say. OK, let's, um, let's end on the subject of China, because uh, I, I heard the Chief of Defence Intelligence speak last week. And he said, although you, uh, Russia was the was the biggest military and geopolitical threat to the security of Europe, uh, China was the biggest threat to the world order as, as a whole, um, which is a striking thing to hear from a UK military figure. Nothing of the sort we'd have heard even a few years ago. And I, I guess the question I have for you all is, do you agree with that assessment? Um, and to the extent that you, 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 you do, or even if you don't, um, how far should the UK be uh, um, uh, uh, being militarily involved in Asia Pacific, for example, sending uh, uh, the carrier on its first operational deployment to the to the to, to the Asia Pacific region, um, and using naval vessels for things like freedom of navigation operations. Um, how does the UK balance between its European commitments and its commitments in other parts of the world, including Asia? And how far should it be willing uh, uh, to 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 uh, use its resources on the side of? the US and other Asian partners like Japan, India and Australia in pushing back against and constraining China's behavior in the region. Uh, so um, let's all go through and perhaps you could also, given we only have nine minutes left, perhaps also offer any closing comments you wish to add uh, at the end of that as well. So Khalid, let's begin with you, please. Well, thank you. Uh, I think, look, I think China uh, has a huge threat uh, and the threat will come through economically, uh, and that is what we're not focusing on. Uh, it's not going to try and do, uh, it might do to, it, issues in terms of cyber. There are issues in terms of viral infections uh, and what's gone on in terms of COVID and how we look at getting China to actually secure its facilities properly uh, in terms of outbreak of any 
uh, viral uh, infections and those sort of uh, issues that, 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 that we need to look at. But I think more in terms of its position globally, it's going to be financially based. Uh, it's, it's command of Africa at the moment. We're, we're going through Southeast Asia at the moment, coming through Europe, coming through Russia. It is really important. And I think what, what we have to do and what the US has to do uh, and the five eyes have to do, and I think Australia, uh, certainly in terms of that, has been quite strong uh, in relation to the 5G uh, equipment and, and how they, they, they look at that. So I think what we have to do is set out different uh, categories of work that we have to look at China and how we deal with them. Uh, and it's not all to do with just your uh, military and, and defense oriented or foreign policy, but we have to look at, at the deals that are there and how we sort of try and get China to come on board with the international community, because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a huge economic boost, which they're getting at the moment, but there's nothing. There's a huge country which manufactures a huge amount and we have to look at how we deal with them and they become part of the international team to deal with that. In terms of the international operation, as Lord West has already said, look, we have a huge interest uh, because most of our uh, uh, supplies are brought in uh, through, through the naval system structures. We have to be out there uh, in that region to be able to see what we can do and how we can perform when their protection is needed, uh, whether it's goods or oil or whatever. Uh, I think we play where it's piracy. Uh, all those sort of things are very important for us to be able to be have the capability to, to go out and support that. But the real issue is how we deal with uh, China is not just militarily. I think that's the policy set on different economic fronts to be able to deal with them and look at the standards. And then also, particularly in terms of security, uh, I think that's very important for us to deal with. Uh, and, and I think that's what I have to say at the moment. So let's see Thank uh, you. where we end up with them. Catherine. Thanks, Shesheng. I think it's a dance. And if we are constantly sitting down, they're going to dance more and become bigger and bigger. And I feel that even though completely Labor has strengthened its position on China, you know, we very much force the government on 5G and also on Hong Kong. But it's also that we're sort of coming a bit late to the party. We have to have be thinking about these things beforehand. So, for example, on the 5G question, that was a very expensive decision that we took in the House of Commons the other day. Had we invested earlier in a proper industrial strategy and actually used the fantastic engineers and, and computer experts who we have to set up our own capability or work with Nokia or the US on that earlier, rather than just saying China are being horrible to us. Well, I don't accept that analysis. I think we've got to do our own thing. We've got to be stronger, not just say they're being mean to us. So I think we've got to strengthen our own approach. And I feel very strongly that Brexit weakens us because China has less reason to listen to the UK if we are one group of one group of 66 million people. If we were still in the club of 550 million, then we might stand a chance to be able to stand up to them more effectively on human rights, more effectively, you know, militarily and in terms of trade. Um, instead, if we want a trade deal with China, of course we can criticise them on the human rights piece on Xinjiang and so on, which is a very principled stand to take. But will we be listened to when it comes to other issues? Because in the end, we're you know, a medium-sized country of 66 million. So I think we've made a few strategic blunders to get ourselves to this point. Um, and we need to very quickly finish this Brexit situation, get back to talking with our European neighbours, get back to getting in with whoever is in Trump or Biden, talking um, much more seriously about the genuine threats that there are to us and start seeing this um, kind of dance in a much more strategic way so that we don't just pretend that people are being nasty to us. We actually have to be strong ourselves and you know, put in the work now in terms of countries in Africa. See, we're about to stop, we're about to cut all this funding to Africa through DFID. That's what we, our government is going to do because they think they need the money for other things. Fine. But in 10 years' time, when we've left Kenya and we've stopped helping strengthening public services and public health and so on there, who's going to be paying for the hospitals? China. So can you see that we're going to about to make another strategic error because of Brexit? 
you know, so I just feel um, we're not thinking through about how we can actually have a 20 year program which looks seriously at the risks um, and the rising power of China, you know, and I feel that then just turning around in 20 years time and saying they're being mean to us, which is sort of how the, the trade talks come across, like a very petulant sort of approach. That's not good enough. We have to start now and say, we're not gonna pull out of Africa. We're not gonna pull out of um, the, you know, in interests and the important collaborations that we have in the Indo-Pacific. We can do both, but we need to be smart about the way that we do it, play to our strengths, you know, keep going with the things that we do well, um, collaborate on the things where we have our gaps, like the 5G and so on, with our alliances of democracies, um, and just overall just be a little bit more grown up about it. And I feel somehow our psychology isn't right. That's a bit of a waffly end piece, Shashank. I'm sorry that I've introduced all that at the last minute, but I feel sometimes we make these mistakes. And then when China has this 20 year game, which we've been watching them for 20 years doing, we then sort of blame them for being mean to us. And I think we've got to just be a bit more mature, um, strong, assertive, without being aggressive necessarily, just be assertive and start just playing the game in a much more strategic, joined up way with our neighbours, with our partners. And it would ver help very much if we had somebody predictable in the White House. OK, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Lord West, do you, want to, do you want to wrap us up, please? Yeah, um, CDS is absolutely right. Um, there's no doubt China is aiming for world hegemony. Xi Jinping has made that absolutely clear in statements he's made. They are a very malign, uh, malign sort of nation in the sense of the way it's governed, not the people themselves. Uh, if one looks at the Ouija's, if one looks at what's happened in Hong Kong, if one looks at the use of body parts, the fact that they do not accept the world order that admittedly was established by the English-speaking peoples after the Second World War, but it actually stood the test of time, they do not accept that. Um, they, they've said UNCLOS uh, has got no status. They believe the South China Sea is theirs. Four trillion dollars worth of trade goes through that. They are extremely dangerous. As already been mentioned, what they're doing in a lot of countries in South America, uh, in Africa, the Belt and Road Initiative, they are aiming and they have a focus and they have a plan, their 20-year plan for world hegemony. That is very worrying when it's a country like that. And we've got to stand up against it. And the way we do that is with alliances. Um, and I think maybe trying to re-strengthen the UN. It's a shame that Trump has weakened the UN so much. You know, that's an area we could do something. Perhaps we should think about a new CATO organization. We should show China, if you do these things, actually people will react and stand up to you and get the other Asian nations to stand up. But we must not let them just go on as he is because that is far too dangerous. And my final thing, because I don't know if you talked about it earlier, the Labour Party, of course, now do firmly support continuous at sea deterrence. That was not the case with our previous man. Um, and I'm very glad to hear it because it, it is actually our ultimate security blanket. The only thing I would say is, and there's a debate going on at the moment, is should, it, should the capital cost be in the defence budget or out of it? I personally believe it should be out of it because it's not a war-fighting weapon. If it war fights, it's lost. It's used every day ensuring our security. So that's enough. I think we've probably got to finish. Thank you very much. And thanks all for, for keeping your remarks succinct. Um, I think some fascinating comments there, interesting points of divergence on uh, the direction of the defence review, defence resourcing, on, on DFID and development uh, and, and some large strategic questions. But also, I think, notable uh, that there's a great deal of, of, of what you would effectively say, you know, is bipartisan consensus on the threat picture from Russia, uh, a threat picture from China, uh, and um, uh, uh, a sense of, of, of there being not terribly substantial uh, party differences on some of those questions. And I think uh, we'll, we'll all wait and see how the review plays out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Khalid Mahmood. Thank you, Catherine West. Thank you, Lord West. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon.